संदीप दास गुप्ता संदीप दास गुप्ता इज़ द वाइस प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ आर एंड डी गेमिंग सिस्टम्स एट साइंटिफिक गेम्स इन हिज आई टी करियर सिंस नाइनटीन नाइन्टी टू ही प्लेड वेरियस रोल्स इंक्लूडिंग लीडिंग आर्किटेक्चर एफर्ट्स एज अ लीड आर्किटेक्ट हेडिंग मल्टीपल टीम्स इन्वॉल्व इन प्रोडक्ट एंड प्लेटफॉर्म डेवलपमेंट एज वेल एज हेडिंग आर एंड डी इन एडवांस टेक्नोलॉजीज संदीप इज ऑल्सो एन एविड टेक्नोलॉजी वॉचर एंड शेयर इज व्यूज ऑन इज पर्सनल ब्लॉग सो वेलकम संदीप टू दी सॉफ्टवेयर लाइफ साइकिल स्टोरीज Thank you. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, I think it is going to be an interesting conversation. I see that you have a lot of uh, you know, different ways of looking at software, particularly the natural software. We'll get into that. Mm-hmm. But maybe for the uh, uh, purpose of introduction, if you can briefly state how you got into software and then what you've been doing, we can uh, take it from there. Great. Yeah, I think that's a good beginning, and that's kind of. uh related to uh how i look at software itself right so um interestingly i actually uh, started out becoming a mechanical engineer because i used to be very interested in mechanics and and automobiles and, and engines and all that right and then as part of the curriculum i think in the second year we got introduced to programming uh for tran and c and all that mm. to help us sort of work with uh, engineering problems right oh, okay and suddenly i kind of found a new love in a way right mm. so i mean when i started i mean i had done a bit of uh, bbc micro uh, programming in school and all that we used okay. to uh, sort of uh, science projects and all that uh, but it that had been more like fun and games and mm. when i started doing serious computing um, in 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 um the uh, mini frames in those times uh, we we kind of uh, we started with main frames in our uh, labs but then we went to went on to mini frames i mean i kind of saw the power the real power of software and computing and all that and that point i suddenly had a change of heart and i said i i want to follow this route rather than the other one right so even though i kind of graduated as a as a mechanical engineer i did a lot of work in computers i mean then i finally went on to take on robotics as my final year uh, sort of uh, specialization so we did a lot of um programming in c etc to uh, kind of program uh, robotic arms and stepper motors and all that and mm. and and also then went to do a sort of um, industry experience uh, uh tour with uh, uh with the defense research development organization where mm. we did some programming for their uh, computerized uh, um machine tools uh, built some uh it, it was interesting we built some parts for uh, some of the agni missiles etc so that's how i kind of managed to stay with computers even though i was kind of graduating as a mechanical engineer and then later after i started working i obviously um gravitated towards the software industry because by then i had already decided that was my first love so okay, good so how did you find the shift from fortran to c ha huh, very interesting <laughs> i also like uh, this program in fortran yeah 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 so i think if you if you know uh, fortran uh, you would know that it's built um, in a, in a very or it is built to be very uh, it it's built to be a good fit for mathematical and and sort of uh, structured mathematical problems and, and that kind of thing right so and and we were using it mostly for that uh, so uh, obviously if you if you know the expansion it's actually formula translation right so it tells you <laughs> everything about what it's meant for right hmm. and and it, it was great to automate and speed up and and do complex mathematics and all that but the moment i moved to c i kind of um, realized that that time what we are talking about today right we are we talk about experience uh, as a major thing today but that's when i realized how it was different right with c 
when I was, for example, I was doing, uh, uh, let's say for a, uh, for a robotic uh, arm, I was doing a lot of computation to figure out what is the most efficient route for an arm to move from point A to point B when, when it needs to do some work, right? I mean, they, obviously, they did, you actually do a 3D plot of it and you figure out the shortest path and all that, right? And that's done through mathematical formulas. Mm -hmm. uh, but not only that, with C, now I could actually plot it out on a graph and show it graphically on a screen that this is the route that the arm is going to take and, and uh, kind of this is how it will move and this is the area it's going to cover and all that, right? So that's, I think, one of the differences that I saw where, where uh, programming languages that have both computational and graphical capabilities, you get, uh, get, you get that power uh, out of it, right? Uh, the second thing is obviously C is much more open. It has a lot more sort of um, depth to its libraries and also I could actually borrow libraries uh, from others who've kind of done similar things and all that. And obviously it depends on the community too. Uh, so Fortran obviously had a smaller community by then. I mean, C had become much more uh, widely accepted. So it had a much larger community. So I could obviously get um, help from that community. So that, that obviously is a difference. And then when object-oriented programming came in, obviously that made a huge difference, right? So then that was a third sort of jump where Fortran obviously didn't have those kind of concepts and C slowly sort of picked up the object-oriented concepts and, 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 the, and then you kind of started seeing it as a fourth generation language rather than a third generation language. Though it is really a third generation, but it slowly transformed itself with C++ and all that into a fourth gen. So those would be, I think, the key differences I see between those kind of languages. Yeah, that's interesting. So from uh, the theme of uh, this podcast, was there any funny things that happened when your thinking had to change from a fairly linear you know, Fortran model to this whole object-oriented, distributed, or your uh, visual programming and all that? Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, that that's, I mean, um, obviously, uh, when we talk about the jump from non-object to object, we obviously give away our um, um, age because that we are talking about more than 20 years ago when this transition happened. In today's world, we kind of we don't think about that at all, right? Because everything has kind of moved to the new paradigms. So uh, um, let me give you a kind of uh, small sort of story about that. Um, one of my first jobs was sort of programming for the National Stock Exchange in India, where we were doing these front ends for uh, the traders, the trader terminals. Uh, and it was all uh, um, object-oriented uh, visual C++ at that time. And um, kind of, um, I, I was still thinking in a way in the, in the sort of traditional uh, sort of, structured programming model because I was kind of coming, I was, I was getting to realize uh, C sort of object oriented programming at that point uh, uh, based on my experience. And um, the, the way I used to sort of structure my thinking uh, would be uh, in a workflow model, right? And, uh, and then uh, when we used to sit down with the uh, with the business analysts and the business folks um, across the table, uh, we would become kind of talking different languages, right? So I would be saying, hey, uh, the, 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 the stock actually, or, or the particular uh, stock that, that we are trying to buy, for example, taking one example, goes from state A to state B to state C, right? So it's, it's an open stock in the market, and then it is, uh, somebody has sort of, uh, put put uh, put a buy order against it, it. Then it is in that state. Then somebody has already bought it, so it's on bought state and all that. And the business folks would be talking about, hey, I'm looking at a chart and I, I I want to see which stocks are going up. And then I kind of click on it and I kind of look at 
that particular stock and then i see what are the similar stocks in the same industry and all that right so we used to be almost like talking in two different uh, languages and it it became very difficult to kind of uh, get to the get to a common ground and then when i then i realized that um i had to change my way of looking at things right so they were obviously looking at the real world um sort of uh picture of 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 a stock and that's exactly what object orientation does right it kind of creates a real world view of uh who what are the different types of objects in the world and i was looking at it from uh it's just a data piece of data and what can i do with it in a program right so um i would say the the funny part was that um the business folks taught me how to do object orientation rather than a, than a technical guru and a technical mentor right so i kind of look at it that way that uh talking to business actually forced me to become a better object oriented programmer rather than the other way yeah that's very interesting that you also mentioned data i guess as engineers we are focused on things that are in a hard that we can grasp and just the data whereas probably the business folks are looking at how do i derive some information how do i act on it and what are you know, some of the newer all this machine learning or uh, finding meaning behind data correct correct but in a way we have come full circle right so from that point so that's that's the interesting part and i think i have a blog about this where it's it's always a deja vu kind of thing right you you keep seeing thing you keep seeing things which seem to be uh a new avatar of old stuff right so it's it's the same here so we went from i mean going back to your previous question right fortran was more about data and manipulation c was a little more uh sort of higher level where you are trying to structure it into maybe functions and and and, and procedures right and then c plus plus came in and they said hey forget data it's all objects right and a data is actually encapsulated within objects or it's more like data is a behavior of an object right mm, so yeah. it's 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 just properties now we have come full circle back to saying hey we want data first design right <laughs> so <laughs> it's like yeah. hey hold on i mean you kind of said we want to go to a real world model where objects are everything and i am i'm i'm modeling my real world as objects and now you're going back and saying no we want a data first design so what does it mean right so i think it's it's kind of Uh, a, a realization that we are we are able to build better computer and so, and software systems because uh, we are un underlying the whole thing we are finally manipulating data right i mean even though we are building object models even though we are be building great gui uh, software underneath the whole thing power is in knowing and manipulating the data and all we are saying is kind of let's let's go back to realize how much power that data gives us and how do we get more and more uh value from that data that we already have and the other things obviously i mean which are with all such things um it's the same story right uh it's it's always a perfect uh coming together of different things right so it's not only that 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 realization has come to us it's also because we are also in a world today where there is a plethora of data and there is we are sitting off on gazillions of uh, bytes of data and we also have the compute power and the and the cloud systems to be able to manipulate in that right? so when all three come together then we can now start talking about data first but i mean i think uh, if 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 the capability to work on those uh, huge volumes of data and the uh, uh, and the kind of um, availability or or easy availability of years worth of data wasn't there then again it wouldn't have been possible so it's i think a combination of all three <clears throat> yeah interesting you know, two questions or thoughts that you know cross my mind where uh, you know one related to your current role mm -hmm. that probably every game probably generates so much data in real time that needs to be processed mm -hmm. both by the computers as well as the players right right so this huge jump in data and associated with that you also mentioned uh, the concept of modeling right you remember one quote uh, i forget who said that first 
is about uh, all models are wrong, but some models are more useful. Right, right. So when we do that, um, the natural, okay, it is not intended, but uh, I thought the natural consequence is that the model should be as close to reality as possible. Right. So I was quite uh, uh, intrigued first when I you know, saw your blogs on natural software engineering. Right. So how did you get to that concept or you know, what kind of triggered the thought behind natural software? Okay, I think good question. <laughs> so yeah, I've, I've, I've been asked many times why I chose that kind of a, a juxtaposition of words in a way, right? And that's, that's one of the reasons I chose it because engineering is always supposed to be a hard, materialistic um, sort of man's world of things, right? I mean, <laughs> it kind of... Right. It, it's it's around construction and machinery and and minerals and uh, building uh, huge factories and all that right so that's where when you say engineering you, those are the pictures that come into mind on the other hand when you say software it's all about the soft stuff right it's the concepts it's the software it's the uh, it's the sort of uh, all the finer details that go behind uh, our, our computers and and, and the logic that we're building, right? So it's, it's these are sort of poles apart, and and bringing those two together is sort of. And I, I wanted to create that clash of uh, ideas and knowingly because I wanted to sort of uh, get people to think about how we are realizing that the software industry is built on people, right? Uh, from all aspects, right? Mm -hmm. And even though we are calling it software engineering, we have to, we keep forgetting it. And that's why I wanted to remind people that we have to keep remembering that this is an engineering which is done using concepts by people and using sort of uh, malleable logic in a way, right? Which is contrasted with other forms of engineering, which are based on physical laws, science, scientific uh, properties, material properties, are built mostly or, 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 or are done mostly by machines and sort of um, non-human uh, activities. And they work on physical materials, right? They work on concrete and steel and, and, and iron and... Um, sort of uh, uh, things with physical properties right. uh, which are not malleable, right? And one, one, one great example I give is if I build a bridge with four lanes and, and a customer comes and tells me next day, hey, I just want to expand it to six lanes, it, it would be a laughable request, right? But if I have built a, a software, a piece of software which kind of handles four types of protocols today, uh, for data traffic and somebody comes and tells me, hey, add two more protocols because I want to now handle two more uh, channels of data. It is a very simple request and, and a very uh, understandable request, right? So, mm -hmm. so that's the difference I want to bring out, that both of these are engineering, but, but the things you are doing with the older forms of engineering, the traditional forms of engineering are very different from what you're doing with software engineering because of the properties. That's one aspect, that this is kind of uh, people-based and it has certain uh, sort of conceptual differences, right? And then there are other things that have been happening recently which, is, which are taking us closer and closer to these things. So one thing is this whole agile concept, right? And uh, if you look at the first principle of agile, which says people over processes and tools, right? And then a lot of times people think that Agile is just another software engineering process. So the, I wanted to bring people back to the thought process that the first principle says people, is, people over processes and tools because they realize that when you are doing or when you are building products using people, your process has to be in a way 
people friendly in, in a way taking into consideration what mm -hmm. makes people work better what makes uh, what is what is it that would get give you the most outcome out of a, a team working together right so it's mm -hmm. it's kind of built upon a bit of uh, 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 human psychology how people work together as teams um, what would make teams uh, sort of self organizing and all that right so those are the aspects that are built into the process so so even the engineering processes that we have started sort of going towards are now understanding that software is a natural process built upon our, our natural thinking process and it should take into account that uh, uh, we, we, we behave differently from machines, right? So that's one, of, well, that's the second aspect. The third aspect is, since you talked about data and, and, and sort of how we are kind of uh, trying to build real world models with, with the data, right? So if you go there, so let's see where technology is going there, right? So today we are talking about um, sort of microservice uh, swarms or, or farms, cloud farms of uh, sort of uh, servers and all that, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we're kind of going back to copying nature by saying, hey, if you break down your large complex workloads into small individual self-driven uh, entities and then bring them together to build larger systems, you will have much better control and and i think we are copying from maybe uh, swarms of bees or ant colonies or fish schools or whatever right so if you see nature has those kind of models and we are kind of copying those kind of models the second thing that is happening with artificial intelligence today right is we are trying to mimic the human brain and what we are realizing is that um, there are certain things that are still unexplainable or not really doable through artificial intelligence. There, there are things like consciousness and, and, and independent thought, which obviously machines cannot be taught yet. Obviously, they might be available <laughs> yeah. later. Uh, but we, we are trying, we are, we are kind of getting to the point where we are realizing that there is still a, a, a barrier between uh, what data engineering can do versus what a conscious thinking natural uh, uh, human being or, 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 or a mammal can do, right? So, so these are the different thought processes that kind of went through my mind and I, I just wanted to bring all of these out into the open by coining a term like natural software. Mm, yeah, that's, that sounds natural, a natural flow of uh, inference. So uh, again, a couple of questions triggered by this. The first is, uh, uh, you know, have you tried any experiments in your own you know, teams or projects in applying some of these natural ways of working? And the second, uh, probably more even um, when you talk about the ant colony and things like that, there is one mastermind. You know, like, are we getting into the big brother model where all technology will eventually be controlled by one artificially intelligent brain? Okay, yeah, I think both very good questions. So let me take them one at a time. The first one, the answer is yes, I try to, I mean, this is this has been the most interesting part of my work in, in, a, a, in a few of the companies that I've been part of since I started this uh, thought process of natural software engineering, right? So as you know, most of our organizations, we are trying to move to agile and I've been deeply involved in a couple of, cases where I've tried to bring in Agile into a system which was not having it before. So I've had a lot of opportunities to experiment, if you will, <laughs> okay. So uh, mm -hmm. one of the things that I have been uh, working with is how do we make teams really uh, self-organizing and, and kind of uh, um, opposite of what you said. There is no central uh, governing authority, right? So mm -hmm. let them go off on their own and create their own uh, stories, right? So, um, and I'm, I'm using stories in a generic sense and not in an agile sense here, by the way. So, uh, 
that that has been a very interesting experiment because um, the moment you take teams and say, hey, you are a self-governing, self-organizing team, and um, this is a new model I'm giving you, work in an agile model, and, and um, sort of show us what you can do, right? It always uh, brings in a lot more enthusiasm, a lot more energy, a lot more uh, new ideas, and, and kind of... Um, I would say even changes the culture to a certain extent. And I'm very sure you've seen that in your personal experience too. Um, so, um, and, and the coming back to the experiment part, um, I kind of have, have seen that um, the, the interesting part, and this is something I keep talking about is even though we say this is natural software engineering and it is tuned to the way we behave, uh, the most interesting thing I see is that we have been sort of um, trained and, and, and sort of molded so much into the box, right? Mm -hmm. That we have actually forgotten our natural, uh, uh, I mean, our natural instincts are almost dead and we have been kind of told to do certain things that way, right? So the most interesting thing that I see is people having to unlearn what they have been taught and become natural is, is actually a very tough task, right? You would think that, hey, I am giving you a better way of, uh, I'm giving you a process that is closer to how you should be uh, working and it will be easier for you to adopt. But because of our conditioning, of, of years of conditioning from, from our school days, we are kind of taught that these are the formula you have to use. This is the only way you should work. Uh, these are the golden rules you should never break. And then you suddenly tell them, hey, there are no rules. You, you go and self-organize. That <laughs> takes a lot of time and learning. So the unlearning and relearning uh, kind of becomes more difficult. So that's, that's an interesting side uh, effect that I see when I try to do these experiments. So has there been an experiment that sorry. probably didn't go the way you anticipated, but in hindsight is kind of funny? Um, yeah, let me try to think of a couple of instances. Uh, uh, so there, there there has been let me let me talk about one case uh, where it was a little uh, funny uh, where we are trying to do we were trying to do uh, the same thing we were trying to build a new team uh, um, and and kind of move them to a new way of uh, uh, working and um, the the obviously the the teams kind of uh, have a lot of questions about what happens when they do this right and there are usually questions on how they would be monitored, um, how would they kind of be, uh, I mean, how would their performance be evaluated? If there is no manager in the team, how, how do they kind of show what they're doing and whom, they are, whom do they show it to and all that, right? Um, so um, in, in one case, uh, we, when one of the teams came back and said, um, we, we kind of are happy doing what you're asking us to do, uh, but uh, we would want to be sort of monitored a little more in the sense that oh. for from a couple of reasons, right? One, we should be able to showcase what we are doing in the sense that if, unless somebody watches over me, how do I show them that I'm doing a great job? And in the second case, and the second reason being, um, I mean, if we are doing something wrong, somebody has to correct us, right? Okay. So, um, and so what I did was, uh, I kind of said, uh, fine, we, we, we have, I mean, and, uh, and it was a conference room. So we, we, we said, we will switch on this camera and we will put you in a conference with me and I'll be watching all your meetings, right? And, uh, and essentially what I did was we, we used to set up these meetings where I would be on conference and, and I kind of used to just uh, 
switch off my side of things. I never really watched what they were doing. And uh, I think a couple of months later, they came back and said, hey, this is working great. After we have started doing this, <laughs> we are more efficient and all that. And obviously, once in a while, they would kind of have certain questions and I would go and talk to them about it. Uh, but, but in reality, there was nothing that changed. It was just their thought that, hey, somebody is watching over us. Right? Mm. So then I went back and told them, hey, uh, do you know what, 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 what was going on? I was actually not even watching what you, were, what you guys were doing. And um, it was just a sort of... Uh, and a, a thought experiment kind of thing, right? Where you thought that you are being mentored, but you're not uh, monitored, but you're not being monitored. Right? And uh, it was funny when, when we kind of, when they realized it, it was kind of a uh, uh, aha moment for them, but it was also a very interesting um, sort of learning for all of us, right? That uh, going back to my point, right? That we have been conditioned in, the, in a way that sometimes, Familiar is better than, uh, I mean, just because something is more familiar, it looks better, right? So that's that's what I finally told them. You've been so used and it's so familiar for you to have somebody watching over you that even though working on your own should be a much more empowering exercise, it becomes a, a, a sort of difficult thing to do because you've not been used to it and you've been conditioned against it. Right? So that was one of the funny incidents that happened. Um, uh, but but uh, obviously, it, it's not something I uh, would advocate. <laughs> it is just that uh, for that team, it kind of, uh, it was something I felt they would uh, learn from and, and it, it kind of happened that way. But uh, obviously, we, we don't, we, in, in agile uh, teams, we do want people to work on their own and there's, there's no concept of monitoring. Yeah, sure. So, yeah. Uh, coming to your second question, right, about um, the Big Brother, whether all about the big, together. big Brother watching you, right? So that's kind of becoming a very, uh, if you are following uh, the uh, artificial intelligence, uh, um, machine learning uh, sort of uh, uh, discussions that are going on all over the world, that's becoming one of the most discussed topics, if you see. Right. Uh, that's always one thing that comes up, right? So, um, is it good? Is it bad? Now it kind of allows you to sort of uh, uh, look at everything. Uh, there, I, I mean, I think I'm I'm not really an expert in this area, but I, again, I'm, I'll just talk about my thoughts and my experience on that side. Um, I see that you're also a technology blogger. That's why I thought, you know, since you watched it, yeah. You <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so this is uh, this is definitely something worthwhile uh, to, to maybe uh, write about. Uh, but um, you will see two schools of thought uh, that that are emerging, right? So one school of thought is that um, you you kind of um, always have a single uh, governing uh, force, right? So even for us humans, if, if you look at it, the brain is always governing things, right? And, and the brain is finally taking decisions for our whole body based on all the inputs that it's getting and, and all the sensory uh, uh, data that, is, that it's receiving, right? And um, is it good or bad? We don't know because, I mean, sometimes the brain takes right decisions, sometimes obviously it takes wrong decisions too, right? But if there is no central uh, control at that point, uh, maybe uh, the holistic decisions won't be possible, right? Because you, you sometimes want to take a holistic decision, which is sort of based on everything that you're seeing rather than, I mean, even though, even though you have touched something hot and your local instinct is saying that, hey, snatch your hand back, your brain knows that, hey, this is a cup of tea that you're holding and if you snatch your hand back, you're going to drop it and splash it all over the floor. So bear, it with, bear with it for a minute and put it on the table. That's a better idea. Right? So that's, that's the kind of higher level decision that we can take right? because we know uh, we, we're getting multiple inputs from different things. Uh, so I think it is similar. right? So uh, even in the organizational world, in the, in the computational world, 
sometimes having a higher level decision making works out because uh, you can then take a holistic view of multiple viewpoints and then kind of come to a decision which is uh, maybe in the best interest of uh, everybody at that point uh, but like i said it's 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 an it's an it's a debatable thing right i mean is that decision the best could it could it have been better that's not what we are debating i'm saying that that concept exists and then it sometimes works right uh, the other school of thought is that um, beyond a certain point, it's in any way going to get impossible with the with the with the kind of uh, huge growth of data and huge growth of or 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 the speed at which the data is growing. Right. So I don't know whether you've heard, but there's a new terminology that is now uh, in use, which is called um, edge AI. Right. So it's basically if you've heard of edge computing, it's the equivalent for artificial intelligence, right? Okay. Yeah. So there are situations now where people are realizing that there is so much data being generated that there is no way a central authority can really work on it, right? And one example that I read about is uh, now in some of the advanced countries, um, all the traffic um, signals are smart, right? So they're actually generating data which is fed to central systems to sort of decide what these traffic signals do. For example, if there's an ambulance coming at that signal, it could actually not only give it a green light, but it could also communicate back to the central system to say, hey, this, this is the direction of the ambulance. Make all the lights green on this uh, road so that the ambulance has a clear way uh, through, right? So those kind of things are happening. And in fact, I've worked on uh, systems in the UK where bus, bus, uh, in the buses, there are um, sort of uh, boxes that talk to the um, uh, traffic signals and then they set up protocols and they, they kind of work together to give a faster route to some route to some of these buses. Right? So there are things that are happening in that direction. But recently, what they have found is with the number of these uh, IoT devices increasing, they have now reached a point where by the time data from all these uh, traffic signals come back to the central authority and the data science works on it and the machine and the artificial intelligence decisions are made and the decisions are sent back, it is, it is too late or I mean, they, they're not able to handle the, the uh, sort of load and they're not able to react in time for the signal to kind of be effective, right? You don't want to be waiting for the signal to be uh, hearing from a central uh, management system for five minutes because hey, other, uh, with, without that it won't change its uh, state, right? Mm -hmm. So now they are building uh, what they call edge AI, where each of the traffic signals will have its own uh, miniature artificial intelligence and it will take local decisions okay mm -hmm. and then they are, they are actually building platforms cloud-based platforms for these kind of systems where where the the computing or the or the artificial or, or the de decision making is the models are built centrally uh, based on the data that's coming in because the the the, the world model that you talked about the, the world view that is built upon data is available centrally because you have all the data there. But then the models are pushed to the edge computing uh, instances and then they start taking local decisions, right? So, so in a way, this is again uh, sort of very natural, right? In the sense that again, in the, the world, you see those kind of things, right? In a beehive, you might have a queen bee which is making certain decisions but once the bees go out on their own and start gathering honey, they have to take local decisions because they don't, they don't have telephones to communicate back with, the, <laughs> with their central authority, right? So it's, it's the same models we are getting to. You know. <clears throat> yeah, that's very interesting. Actually, there are uh, a few more theories that I'd come across, but maybe those could be for a later time. One is uh, the fractals. Mm -hmm. uh, what is called the chaotic 
organizations and chaotic setups where there's both chaos as well as order and how do you can correct correct yeah. 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 Uh, so um, again keeping in uh, mind the theme of this podcast what amuses you about technology mm. <laughs> that's a good question uh, because again it's the same thing right we we started taking technology so seriously that it kind of becomes a strange question right i mean how can technology and amusement go together right uh, i think what amuses me is that people sometimes forget that technology can go only so far right i mean a lot of the times there are two kinds of i mean i mean uh, I see this happening in two kind of scenarios. One scenario is you feel that technology can solve all problems and, and, and it's kind of, um, you give it more credit than you should, right? I mean, you, you believe that uh, just because you're using the best technology, you're using the latest iPhone or the latest Samsung um, um, phone, and you, you will be happier, right? In a way, I'm, I'm just taking an ex extreme example right. that just getting the latest technology will make me the happiest person in the world. So that's one kind of example where we feel that technology can really take away uh, all other aspects uh, and, and make things better without realizing that uh, technology can only do something about um, helping us take decisions or helping us do things better or helping us do things more accurately, uh, but it cannot um, change or it cannot really have an effect on societal stuff, on, on human relation stuff, on, on, on our well-being, unless we are ready to sort of understand and make the changes ourselves within our society, within our own minds, within our uh, interrelationships and all that. The second aspect is um, kind of uh, people uh, think of technology um, as, I mean, people who are too, or, or maybe because people are getting so exposed to technology, uh, they kind of start believing the virtual for the real, right? That's also sometimes very funny. And, and I've had personal experiences like that, right? Where, mm -hmm. um, you will sort of, I mean, I, I, I don't know whether it has happened to you, but if you get too used to these uh, modern um, um, sort of keyless cars where you just press a button and the car uh, unlocks, right? I have at least had a couple of cases where I've, I've looked for a button when I reach home to unlock the door and all that, right? So it's as <laughs> if I just uh, press that and the things will automatically unlock, right? So those kind of things where you go get lost so much in technology that you mix or you sort of get mixed up between the virtual and the real, right? So that's also uh, funny. And, and I've had a lot of friends tell me stories where those kind of things have happened, where um, they have kind of, um, I, I, one of the jokes that I have seen on, on, I think on WhatsApp, which kind of deals with this is uh, maybe, maybe you've come across this, that some, somebody says, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, uh, replicate my Facebook experience and I've gone, I've started going across the street and telling people what I ate in the morning and how I'm feeling and showing them pictures of my dog. And, uh, and, and I'm, I, and uh, the good thing is I have, a th I have three followers already, uh, but one of them is a policeman. The other is a psychiatrist. And the third one is uh, sort of, uh, a, a, a street vendor who wants me to uh, who wants to get me out of the street as soon as possible because I'm distracting <laughs> people. Right? So, so that's what happens when you kind of mix virtual with real. So that's the funny part where uh, we we we've become so lost in technology that that we forget that it's still uh, very different from our real world. Mm. Yeah, that's I think a very good story to close this session. I guess we can go on for a long time. Uh, so thank you, Sandeep, for being a guest. And uh, I do have, again, a whole set of questions or topics that we can discuss uh, probably in one of the future episodes. Sure, sure. Great. I think 
I, I had a great time too. And, and uh, I think some uh, really interesting topics you brought up. So uh, uh, thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Yeah. So if uh, any of our listeners want to reach you, uh, would you mind if they reach out to you? We'll be probably be sharing your contact details uh, on the page where we will have the podcast. Sure, sure. Yeah, you, can yeah. you can share that. I, 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 I'll, we'll definitely, uh, I'll definitely provide my Twitter handle and maybe my blog site uh, URL too. Mm-hmm. And I'm also available on LinkedIn. Uh, so you can share those. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Sandeep. And have a good weekend. You too. Thank you so much.